Welcome to the award-winning Consumer Finance Monitor podcast, where we explore important new developments in the world of consumer financial services and what they mean for your business, your customers, and the industry. This is a weekly show brought to you by the Consumer Financial Services Group at the Ballard Spar Law Firm. I'm your host, Alan Kaplinsky, the former practice group leader for 25 years and now senior counsel of the Consumer Financial Services Group at Ballard Spar. And I'm very pleased to be moderating today's program. For those of you who want even more information, don't forget about our blog, ConsumerFinanceMonitor.com, shares the same name as our podcast show. We've hosted our blog since 2011, so there's a lot of relevant industry content there. We also regularly host webinars on subjects of interest to those in the industry. So to subscribe to our blog or to get on the list for our webinars, please visit us at BallardSpar.com. And if you like our podcast, please let us know about it. Leave us a review on Apple Podcasts, Google, or wherever else you obtain your podcasts. Also, Please let us know if you have ideas for other topics that we should consider covering or if you can recommend speakers that we should consider as guests on our show. Well, today is part two of our podcast show. Uh, Part one uh, was done a week ago. uh, And uh, the topic, uh, of course, was how the U.S. Supreme Court will decide the threat to the CFPB's funding and structure. And of course, what we are referring to in the title is the uh, monumentally important Fifth Circuit opinion uh, that uh, came down several months ago uh, in a case called CFSA versus the CFPB, uh, which amounted to, among other things, uh, a challenge to the funding of the CFPB. Uh, The fact that the CFPB is funded not through congressional appropriations, but rather is funded by the Federal Reserve System or the Federal Reserve Board, uh, uh, up to a certain percentage of the Federal Reserve System's budget. And in part one, we featured our very special guest, uh, Adam White, who is back again uh, for part two. Adam is a senior fellow at the American Enterprise Institute, and he's co-director of George Mason University's Gray Center for the Study of the Administrative State. Last year, President Biden appointed him to the Presidential Commission on the Supreme Court of the United States. He also serves on the Administrative Conference of the United States. And he is the next chair of the American Bar Association's Administrative Law Section. We are also joined again today by my three colleagues at Ballard Spar, uh, Mike Gordon, Rich Andriano, and John Colhane. Mike Gordon, is a, uh, an alumnus of the CFPB. He spent many years uh, during the formative uh, period for the CFPB, and he was a special advisor to the de- then uh, director, Richard Cordray. Rich Andriano is the chair of our mortgage banking group at Ballard Spar. So he has particular interest in the impact that this decision could have on the mortgage banking industry. And then finally, let me introduce uh, John Colhane. Uh, John is um, uh, really an expert in all consumer financial services law. Uh, he, I, I kid John Uh, and other people by saying that he has encyclopedic knowledge of 
consumer finance law. That means not just the statutes and the regulations, but he knows all the cases and generally knows the citation in the federal reporter uh, for each case. And I kid you not. Um, So um, without further ado, let's uh, get into our uh, program today. I want to call on uh, Rich, Rich Andriano. Uh, First, Rich, uh, I don't know if this is the point you're going to make, but I'd like to get your thinking about this severability uh, issue, because we had a little colloquy earlier today where uh, we concluded uh, that the severability clause that's in Dodd-Frank might actually be um, used here by the Supreme Court. So, Rich, why don't you start, and then uh, I'd like to get the views of my other colleagues. Yeah, there is a provision. It's almost like Congress envisioned the Fed money not being available or not enough, and that the Bureau could ask for appropriations, although we think Congress separately could simply, outside of that Dodd-Frank provision, probably appropriate money. I think the issue would come down to, which we may get a little later, is in to get the agreement of Republicans to appropriate funds, what changes to the Bureau structure would they insist on? I think that's where it would come down to. Uh, Interestingly, what you would get from the industry is uh, a strong you know, uh, arm twist of Congress to make sure the rules stay effective. Because, uh, And we saw that in the SELA law case, uh, where, in fact, that we discussed before, and that's where the Supreme Court ruled that the four-cause removal uh, provision was unconstitutional, and they severed it. Uh, where the industry got worried is SELA law argued that perhaps the right remedy was to overturn the Consumer Financial Protection Act, which would throw out the Bureau and everything with it. And they were very concerned. So the Mortgage Bankers Association, National Association of Home Builders, and National Association of Realtors uh, filed an amicus brief with the Supreme Court. They did not address the constitutional question, was the four-cause removal provision constitutional or not? They solely focused on the remedy and said the remedy should simply be limited to severing the four-cause removal provision, let everything else stand. And they indicated the chaos that would result if all the Bureau's rules were thrown out, that it would – people – lenders would stop making loans. Investors would stop buying loans. Consumers couldn't buy or sell homes because no one would make them a loan. And they pointed to two rules in particular, just to say, look what this is just two of the rules. One was the Truth and Lending Act, Real Estate Settlement Procedures Act, integrated disclosure rule, commonly known as the TRID rule. It took the Truth and Lending Act disclosures and the RESPA disclosures, put them into combined disclosures. Significantly, the Bureau, with their great exemptive authority, exempted the industry from certain statutory requirements under the rule and modified certain statutory requirements. If you throw that rule out, you're left with a statute and disclosures that don't comply with the statute. The other rule they pointed was the ability to repay rule, the bedrock Dodd-Frank rule requiring that you know, mortgage lenders make a reasonable determination that the consumer can repay a loan uh, at the time of consummation of the loan. Significantly, while the statute gives guidance to the Bureau. A lot of the provisions that the industry relies on are provisions solely of regulation based on congressional authority. In particular, the qualified mortgage for loans based on loans being eligible for sale to Fannie and Freddie is purely a regulatory provision. Billions and billions of dollars were were originated under that qualified mortgage safe harbor. If the rule is thrown out, you have billions and billions of dollars of loans that do not comply with the ability to repay statutory provisions. So that's just two rules. Uh, it, it would cascade down. So here you have three major trade associations uh, arguing for a minimalistic remedy. My guess is you'll see those trade associations or even a broader group file an amicus brief with the Supreme Court making the same arguments in this case, that if they strike down the funding, that there should just be a severance of that provision, but not to throw out the whole validity and not deem that the lack of funding rendered the rules uh, invalid, because that would be a very bad result for the industry and for consumers as well. And I think you'll see consumer groups and the industry make the same argument. Yeah, interesting. Uh, strange bedfellows. So, John, uh, 
I'm wondering if you could, um, uh, Rich did a really good job of talking about um, some of the um, uh, very bad results that could conclu- that might happen to in the mortgage area if uh, uh, if the mortgage regs that were adopted early on in the CFPB's uh, life if they were thrown out. What about the non mortgage area, John? Well, I, I think we're in some respects we're in the same place, Alan. There are a lot of rules that um, the broader consumer financial services services industry has um, uh, structured themselves to operate under and get benefit from. I'm I'm thinking that although there are a lot of maybe individual provisions in Regulation F, the debt collection rule that, you know, debt collectors would, uh, if they could pick and choose, would throw tiny pieces out. But um, the provisions for call frequency, the the great support for electronic communications uh, under those rules. If we throw out the debt collection rule, Regulation F, we're back to real chaos in, in the collection industry in terms of, um, you know, what what call frequency is permitted, whether texts and, and emails are subject to the same kinds of limitations uh, as uh, as other communications. Um, another rule that has been very helpful for the industry are the amendments to Regulation Z that were adopted by the, folk, the uh, CFPB uh, to accommodate the transition from uh, LIBOR to SOFR. And I, I think we'd, we'd really hate to see those rules get thrown out. Um, there are very extensive rules now for you know, governing remittance transfers, um, the industry has adopted to those rules. Again, as, as Rich said, with the mortgage rules, there are some um, provisions there that are actually favorable for the industry. Uh, I, th- I think that having that thrown out would, would likewise be problematic. Um, it, it's, a, it's a difficult situation, but I think, as, as Rich said, I think the, uh, probably the, the trade associations will support um, having the regulations stay in place and, and, and ask the Supreme Court not to uh, overturn other regulations with, I guess, with the possible exception of the, the payday loan rule uh, in the case, uh, since it hasn't gone into effect. Um, yeah. But it's... it's and, uh, and I guess, John, uh, there might be a few industries, uh, sub-industries within the consumer financial services industry that... Uh, would probably shed only crocodile tears uh, if the CFPB was eliminated. But, uh, you know, I'm thinking of of installment lenders and, uh, uh, I don't know, um, some of the fintech companies that are providing services uh, where there aren't specific regulations that uh, they rely upon. Yes, certainly the CFPB has uh, proposed kind of an aggressive agenda going forward. And uh, I I think there'd be a a lot of uh, tears over curtailment of of that aggressive agenda. Uh, But that may be something that we're going to see through some kind of congressional compromise as to to the scope of the CFPB going forward. yeah, Mike, let me turn to you now, uh, because um, I want you to put on your the, 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 the hat that you wore when you spent uh, five years or so at the CFPB. Uh, and uh, uh, there were a number of crises that occurred uh, while you were there. Uh, what's the posture of the CFPB now? I mean, I guess there are maybe two postures what they're saying to the outside world and maybe the discussions that are going on internally uh, where maybe that's the, the, the look might be a little bit different, but well, is it business as usual at the Bureau? So certainly publicly, yes, that messaging is loud and clear. And um, I've heard it from individuals and I think the director is also you know, exuding confidence and, um, and really what choice do they have as an agency, um, on that score, but behind closed doors, um, I actually think it's 
not that far off from the public messaging. I would imagine that they would think twice before filing new matters in the Fifth Circuit uh, or mm -hmm. initiating new investigations in the Fifth Circuit. But um, they might go ahead and do it anyway. And um, I would, and, and we've seen continued activity outside the Fifth Circuit and in, in the enforcement realm. And of course, a flurry of activity for the types of policy guidance and uh, pronouncements that the Bureau likes to make these days. We've seen lots of activity uh, on that front and exams continue and examination work and findings continue. So in many ways, it is business as usual and they're continuing to push forward until someone uh, pushes back. Um, and, you know, that's not surprising. I think for any agency, it's I think particularly expected for an agency with which takes the kind of aggressive posture that this one does. Right, right. Uh, it, it, yesterday and the day before, Director Chopra testified before the Senate Committee, Financial Services Committee, and the House uh, Financial Services Committee, uh, and he certainly uh, didn't look like he was quaking in his boots uh, the, during those the, the, the hearing. Um, he didn't seem uh, particularly worried about the case. Um, the, um, uh, the the one thing that I uh, wondered about, but maybe this just is in, in Rohi Chopra's nature, uh, he, whether he's thinking further down the road that he may have to, at some point, this case comes out the wrong way, he may have to go on bended knee to Congress uh, seeking money for the survival of the CFPB. And, you know, the more activity that goes on while this case is pending, does he end up, does he run the risk of creating further enemies in Congress? And so if, if that's the case, that would, you know, if I were advising him, I might say, be a little cautious here, uh, you know, during this uh, interim period, because, we don't want any of the things that we do in the next several months to come back to haunt us. What, 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 what's your reaction to that, uh, Mike? That, that Rohit probably wouldn't hire you to advise him. Um, <laughs> I, I, I think, um, yeah, I think that battle lines have been drawn for quite some time. There's potentially a risk of what you're talking about, of some movement politically of people becoming more opposed to the Bureau over the next few months, based on the way the Bureau behaves than they were before. But that seems marginal to me uh, in the larger calculation. And, and as you said, uh, I watched Rohit's appearance uh, on the Hill this week, and it didn't seem like he, he was modulating his message or his approach in any way out of that concern or any other concern. Um, they've got an agenda. He feels strongly about it. Um, it involves, I think, in my view, pushing the envelope in certain areas, but they haven't made any public indication that they're going to stop pushing. Um, and right. honestly, I don't know that it would make, what I'm saying is I don't think it would make much of a difference one way or the other in the final analysis on some legislative compromise, how they behave in the next few months. Right, right. So uh, let, let's talk about a um, another uh, topic. Let's say you're handling a case right now, an enforcement case with the CFPB. Uh, is this a good time uh, to, to get a settlement uh, in the case? Uh, it, there's a fire sale going on at the Bureau where uh, while there's this cloud of uncertainty that's hanging over the Bureau, would they be more inclined to be a little kinder? in the kind of relief that they seek, the kind of civil money penalties that they seek, uh, or, or uh, is it not going to matter to them one way or the other? We have seen a few cases settle uh, since the opinion came down. And to me, it, it struck me that, uh, some, uh, you know, the, the relief and the civil money penalties didn't see, seem as draconian as they sometimes have seemed. So you think something's going on there, Mike? Well, I think about this in a couple of ways. If you're a litigant on the receiving end of an enforcement matter, you're certainly going to try to drive a harder bargain now before you would settle in light of this constitutional cloud. And 
you know, the Bureau, I think, would never admit that they are giving uh, uh, some leeway based on that, but it may very well happen. And uh, on the other hand, do you want to be signing a, an enforcement order uh, that you may never get out from under or be able to reverse if, in fact, the Supreme Court rules against the Bureau? You know, there, there's an argument for waiting as well. I, I, I look back at the recent cases that have been publicly announced or settled since the Fifth Circuit opinion. Um, and I don't see strong indications of the Bureau being being settling on the cheap right now. There's perhaps there, there was there there was one case with a small specialty funding company that settled, and they have to pay back folks who were allegedly harmed to the tune of six hundred thousand dollars. And there was a one dollar CMP, which is an odd thing, but it allows the Bureau to then let those uh, affected consumers uh, partake of the CMP fund if if they if they're eligible which they wouldn't if there weren't a, a penalty assessed so that that number that one dollar number jumped out at me but I think there's a rationale there and I'm not sure that that firm is a going concern and so the smaller amounts of relief you know they could be due to this dynamic or they could have been due to the general uh, circumstances of the case a couple other cases where uh, CMPs were a, a combined with redress were in the millions, um, and uh, maybe maybe you could argue some of these were on the low end, but I'm not sure. They seemed more or less in the mainstream, and they're only it's pretty small sample size too of cases since the Fifth Circuit decision. So I'm not going to draw that conclusion. But like I said, what this means, what this decision means for you as an institution very much depends on your circumstances and where you are vis-a-vis the Bureau's exertion of power. If you're in active litigation, it's one thing. If you're in the Fifth Circuit, uh, it's, it's an extreme example. But there are lots of other shades of gray where the Bureau may be knocking on your door for an exam or uh, negotiating around uh, around information requests uh, associated with that or some other authority that it has to seek information. Um, and then finally, you know, there's just general compliance with rulemaking. And, um, you know, and in that realm, uh, the Bureau's not knocking on your door and you're looking at your compliance obligations as a company. Uh, I'm not sure, you know, it's, it's a wise thing to consider this case to change your calculation on terms of your compliance obligations. Uh, in any sense, even if there's some theoretical chance that it won't be the CFPB that would enforce them, I think uh, it's wise to, for a lot of reasons, to continue to take the same compliance posture you took prior to this Fifth Circuit decision. Some someone's going to be enforcing these laws. It's we think it's likely to be the CFPB in some form or another. Um, but the laws aren't going away. The um, and uh, even if some of the rules are in question, uh, and of course, in many cases. The requirements overlap with state law requirements uh, that you need to follow anyway, and state law UDAP. And so, you know, I don't, I don't have a lot of clients coming to me saying, "Hey, now, you know, now we can blow up our compliance program." Uh, but there is a range, and there, there, there is a range of activity, and I think each company should think carefully about how this decision might uh, affect what their optionality is. I'm going to conclude. We're drawing to the end of our webinar. We've got about five minutes left. And uh, my final question that I'm going to pose uh, to each of you is what happens when the dust settles? Supreme Court, Grand Cert, they decide the case. uh, And let's make the assumption that uh, they decide that it's unconstitutional. Uh, Commerce gets involved. Uh, and, and, um, you know, uh, if you were look, to look into your, um, just make a, a projection of what things are going to look like, uh, when all of this is said and done and we've moved on from a discussion of this Fifth Circuit case, I want to start, uh, with you, John, first, uh, and then, uh, let's go to, uh, to Rich. Uh, then, uh, uh, then I'd like to, we'll break it up. I'll go to, um, Adam and then finally uh, to you, Mike. So John, what's your, um, what, well, what do you I, think? I think the easy prediction, and I don't want to throw a bunch of things out here. I want to leave room for everybody to discuss this is we're going to have a five member commission, 
or, or something similar uh, in charge of the CFPB. That's going to be, I think, the the minimum uh, that the CFPB will be able to escape with and, and get appropriated funding. I think there are going to be lots of questions about how much and how often, and I, I'd have to think that on the how often the, the, there'll be a fair amount of pressure to have them coming back every year. Let, let me stop there. And, and uh, Yeah. Okay. Uh, Rich, what do you yeah, think? Yeah, I agree with, I agree with John, you know, on, on budget, uh, a commission, bipartisan commission. Uh, in general, I could see, you know, the, the industry would want some confirmation that the rules are valid rules. They would look to something along those lines. And that'll depend on what the Supreme Court does, obviously, if they call into question the legitimacy of the rules. But if they do, they'd want something to address that. Uh, two particular rules I could see is they probably want the UDAP authority further specified to curtail the extraordinarily broad usage. And if I had to pick a specific mortgage rule, they would want revisited it would probably be the servicing rules. Yeah. The uh, the one thing that got alluded to a little bit earlier and uh, just and it's the really the gravamen of the complaint filed by the Chamber of Commerce against the CFPB. Uh, the industry, I would say, is just about unanimously opposed to the um, decision by uh, Roe Chopra to amend the examination manual dealing with the UDAP uh, to encompass or to define the term unfairness to include discrimination. And uh, I have a feeling that uh, uh, that's going to be targeted uh, by the industry and by Congress. Uh, wh- what do you think, uh, Adam? Does settle? A couple, where are you? couple of things. First of all, and we shouldn't discount the possibility the court will affirm the funding structure. Uh, and if it does, I think what's going to follow from that a few years down the road, the next time that uh, Democrats have unified control of government, you'll see some talk about giving the SEC and the CFTC a similar funding structure. When the CFPB was first created, the chairs of the SEC and the CFTC both said in hearings and elsewhere, they wanted the same kind of funding structure. And judicial leg- legitimization of the funding structure would probably put a wind in those sails. Now, if the court strikes uh, down the funding structure, I don't, I don't uh, anticipate this being the end of the agency at all. In fact, you know, the fact that the appropriations process now is basically done through continuing resolutions and omnibus bills, me and, you know, the sort of the, the, sh- the showdowns that we see once or twice a year, means that it'll probably be easier for an administration to get funding for the CFPB because nobody's going to shut down the government over the CFPB, although I suppose those are famous last words, but I don't, I don't think they would. Um, and to the extent that, that, that there is a push for legislative reform of the CFPB, I agree with some of the things that have been said already. You could see a push for, re, for greater specification on UDAP authority and a push for a multi-member commission structure. Again, that's what uh, then-Professor Elizabeth Warren first proposed the CFPB to be a multi-member commission. And soon after Dodd-Frank's enactment, you did see bills coming out of House Financial Services, uh, Congressman Duffy and Henserling and others, pushing to make the CFPB a multi-member commission like the FTC. And, and it's not hard to imagine those coming back again. Right. Finally, uh, Mike, I guess I'll give you the last say of, on our panel. Yeah, I, I tend to agree with what the, all the comments uh, we just heard. Uh, the only thing I would add to the mix is that it could be a really wild year. I mean, because of the brinkmanship that certain parties on the Hill may be willing to to go to before this is resolved. And and I think that we're in an interesting time with respect to the lobbying power of the finance services industry, where it's, you know, they, because of the mortgage market implications that Rich talked about, Maybe want maybe want a quick resolution by Congress that preserves status quo on certain mortgage rules, but uh, I'm not sure their voice is as strong as it used to be. Um, frankly, on, on the Republican side of the aisle, there's just, it's a very mixed um, environment in terms of uh, the political pressures and, and 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 put that all in with a new House leadership that I think is already sort of signaling a, wi- a willingness to play hardball on certain issues. And they may choose to play hardball on this issue, even if industry is uncomfortable with that. And so I think it'll be a wild process to get there. But I, I agree in the end of the day, 
the Bureau in some form will exist. That form could very well be a commission, and there might be some other tinkering with the Bureau's authorities on top of it. So I want to thank Adam White, our very special guest today. Uh, and I want to thank my colleagues at Ballard Spar, Mike Gordon, Rich Andriano, and John Colhane. And of course, I want to thank all of our listeners today who have uh, downloaded our podcast show uh, and uh, uh, who probably, I'm assuming most of you have already heard part one. But if you haven't, I strongly encourage you uh, to listen uh, to part one because there is a lot of pithy analysis of uh, the Supreme Court uh, case and predictions as to uh, the outcome uh, by uh, uh, Adam White, our special guest. So to make sure you don't miss any of our future episodes, subscribe to our show on your favorite podcast platform, be it Apple Podcasts, Google, Spotify, or wherever you download your podcast shows. And don't forget about our blog, ConsumerFinanceMonitor.com, for daily insights on the consumer finance industry. And if you have any questions or suggestions for the show, please email us at podcast at ballardspar.com. Stay tuned each Thursday for a new episode of our show. Thank you very much for listening today and have a good day.